Hello, I'm Richard Bono, and I want to just uh, thank the uh, Magic Workshop for convening this meeting and for the invitation. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the work we've been doing at Liverpool uh, as part of the uh, DEEP group, or Determining Earth Evolution from Paleomagnetism, and focusing on uh, our efforts to try to bridge uh, dynamo simulations and paleomagnetic observations. So the DEEP project is this very large uh, multi-institution uh, um, initiative, uh, mostly uh, Liverpool, but we also uh, work very closely with, with people at Leeds and Lancashire and, and others from all over. Uh, this is just a snapshot of um, some of the PIs and, and postdocs and students, and I'm sure I've missed some people, but um, this is just to show how, how big of an effort this is and how I'm just one small part of it. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit of what we're actually trying to do, and um, which is, as I said, use dynamo simulations to kind of extend and improve our understanding of Earth's field that we get from the observations. And to do that, we need to kind of define what we mean by an Earth-like simulation and, and our approach and our attempt to answer that question. And then some of the applications of this uh, um, initiative and this sort of QPM approach. And we're going to be looking at uh, dipolarity of the field um, and what we can get out of simulations, as well as what that means for uh, dipolarity uh, going back in time, as well as uh, some sort of things that break that trend, strange fields, uh, um, uh, high paleo-secular variation in the South Atlantic, weak fields in Devonian and then the Proterozoic, and um, this perennial question about can we model inner core onset and what does that mean for Earth's magnetic field? So this is a figure that I think will be familiar to, to most people. Uh, this is my version of it. And what we are looking at is uh, the field strength uh, versus time spanning the last 4 billion years. And um, there are a few takeaways about this I'm hoping people will, will have. One, that the field has been very long lived. Probably for the last four billion years, we've had a dynamo. But our observations of it are quite sparse. So these black circles and red circles are median field strength for 200 million year bins. And the circle is black if we have at least 10 observations. And you can see that there are several intervals spanning hundreds of millions of years where we have less than 10 observations of the field. And that um, remains a large challenge to the community. And other than observations and just getting more data, we ask, can we fill in some of these gaps? And the way we want to go about that is using numerical dynamo simulations. Now, these are um, simulations which equ uh, solve equations for a flow uh, on temperature and, and um, magnetic field inside the core and uh, simulate what a dynamo is doing. And the question, though, is do these dynamo simulations resemble Earth's geodynamo? Uh, there are some broad properties that they're very successful at doing. They can re reverse. They can have stable dipole intervals. But is this an Earth-like geodynamo? Addressing the question of whether a dynamo simulation is Earth-like is not a new one. Uh, perhaps the most uh, common approach is the criteria set forth by uh, Christensen and others, where what they did is they looked at a um, observational model of the Earth's field, uh, GAFEM. So this is a continuous time series with a full spherical harmonic description of the field for the last 400 years. And then they calculated at the core mantle boundary a set of properties that are commonly looked at in the dynamo community, specifically uh, these listed on the side here. And then what they found is they were able to calculate um, a misfit for any given dynamo simulation to the values they found for Earth for the last uh, 400 years. And on the plot on the right, you can see the, the outcome where the, the darker the shading of the symbol, the better the agreement of that simulation was with GAFEM. Uh, so the axes here are a, a magnetic Ekman number versus uh, magnetic Reynolds. And they found that you could draw this dashed line, the so-called wedge, where simulations inside of it did a better job of reproducing the present-day Earth field. 
And this is good because that cross way over on the left, several orders of magnitude away from these simulations is where we think Earth falls. Now this whole approach is necessary because we can't actually get directly out of a simulation Earth-like values because we're not able to simulate uh, presently uh, an Earth-like parameter regime. So we have to look for these metrics and indices that can give us an idea of how the field is behaving. The Christensen criteria try to answer the question of, is a dynamo simulation like today's magnetic field? And this has been extended back to the last 10,000 years uh, using Cal S10, and this is the work of Davies and Constable. But even looking back over a 10,000 year uh, interval, that really doesn't get us into the regime that uh, paleomagnetic uh, um, data really kind of resides in, where we're trying to look at the time average field, where we've been able to average secular variation. So that naturally prompts the question, how do dynamo simulations behave on long time scales? And we can't use the, the Christensen criteria to answer that question because they require a, a full set, a spherical harmonic description of the field where we really can't get that out of a paleomag because we have nowhere near the, uh, the spatial and temporal coverage required. So another approach is needed. Our attempt to answer that question was the development of this QPM or quality of paleomagnetic modeling criteria. And the philosophy here is that instead of trying to bring paleomagnetic observations to the dynamo space, we're going to try to generate pseudo paleomagnetic data using a dynamo simulation and then compare that with our paleomagnetic observations. And we came up with a set of criteria that we wanted to um, reflect the time average field and paleosecular variation. We focus for now on the last 10 million years because that's when we think we have uh, enough data to do that. And unlike uh, the Christensen criteria, this is being done at Earth's surface, which is where our field is being recorded in um, rocks. So we uh, settled on five aspects of the field. We look at uh, reversals and the proportion of time spent in a transitional state. We look at uh, VGP dispersion as our, as our uh, description of PSV behavior. So here we're focusing on the model G quadratic fit of uh, VGP dispersion versus uh, latitude. And in our formulation, A represents the equatorial dispersion, which is the minimum of the quadratic, and B is the latitude dependence of it. Uh, Model G has its limitations and drawbacks, but it's fairly simple, it's widely reported, and we think that, and it's easily calculated. So we think it's a reasonable compromise uh, to get to this aspect of PSV behavior. We also look at the variability of VDMs. Uh, it'd be nice to look at VDMs directly, but then we would have to package in our assumptions about how to scale a dynamo simulation to Tesla and amps meter squared. And we didn't really want to bundle those assumptions in with our analysis. So we're focusing just on how a VDM uh, varies over this time interval. And that's just done by ratioing the interquartile range of a VDM distribution over its median, which allows us to compare simulations uh, run at different parameter spaces and, and Earth data. And then finally, we look at inclination anomaly to get some insight on how GAD-like the field is. There are different ways to calculate it. In this approach, we decided to use the unit vector. We know that that can introduce some artifacts into your inclination anomaly, but it allowed us to more directly compare it with our, our baseline. Having come up with the criteria we want to use to uh, look at a dynamo simulation, we needed a baseline for what Earth-like means from our observations. So we chose two data sets, the PSV10 data set out of this excellent compilation by, by Cromwell and others, and uh, the Pint data set. Now these both span the last 10 million years. These both look at uh, primarily volcanic units. Uh, they have fairly good global coverage and temporal coverage going back to 10 million years, but really most of the data comes from the last 5 million years, and really even that much of it comes from the Bruins. In any case, we think this represents uh, uh, enough data with enough distribution 
to give us a good sense about what we think the time average field was doing on Earth for the last 10 million years. With our baseline established and our criteria established, we can uh, actually calculate a QPM uh, score. So the way we do that is we first uh, downsample our simulation to the sampling resolution available from PSV10 and Pint. With that set of data, uh, pseudo data, we can calculate all of the parameters that make up our um, different criteria. And then we can repeat this uh, 10,000 times, allowing us to estimate a, a median and the confidence interval. We then characterize that by calculating a misfit term, which basically if uh, Earth and our simulation have overlapping uncertainties, then we say the misfit is less than one. And if they do not, the misfit is greater than one. If misfit is less than one, that particular criterion gets a score of one. So in the best case scenario, our QPM score will be five and the misfit, the sum of the misfits, our misfit total will be less than five. Uh, in practice, we find that it's possible to get misfits of less than five while QPM itself is not five. And that happens when a model is close, but not close enough to passing. And um, these are still, though, we think worthy of considering um, in a broader context. We have now been able to um, quantify this QPM uh, over for over 85 Dynamo simulations. Uh, these are run for at least 100,000 years and span all different kinds of um, boundary conditions, uh, driving mechanisms, uh, uh, Core, core structure, inner core radius, um, et cetera. For the Dynamo people, these are run in Ekman numbers from uh, one to the negative three to one to the negative four. Uh, we do have a few that are a lower Ekman number. They're not presented here. Uh, they're really exciting um, and they, they look quite promising, but it's they're too new to really kind of fold into our analysis. Trying to break down how these models do in the QPM context, though, it can uh, be a, a little concerning. So we find that in uh, QPM scores, most models get a score of a one or a two. So they don't actually agree very well with Earth. A handful of models do have QPMs of uh, four, so that's promising. But we haven't actually found a model that can simultaneously satisfy all of our criteria. Uh, in this time averaged um, Earth-like field. Looking at the individual criteria and trying to see how well each one does, we see that the two, that the reversal criterion and the uh, equatorial dispersion are the two that have the most difficult time being satisfied in the dynamo simulations. And while it's not the focus of this talk, what I can tell you, and you can look at Domenico Maduri's paper, which I'll show the reference in a moment, is that it seems to be a bit of a trade-off. Either we have a model with enough variability that it can reverse, but then VGP dispersion is too great. Or if the VGP dispersion is in sort of this Earth-like uh, range, there's not enough uh, variability for it to reverse. And kind of walking that knife edge is an ongoing challenge. Nevertheless, even with some of these challenges about how Earth-like our entire suite of dynamo simulations, we are able to gain some insight about how dynamo simulations uh, reflect uh, Earth's uh, magnetic field. And uh, the thing I want to look at first is this concept of dipolarity, which is very commonly considered in the dynamo community and uh, I think is intuitively uh, uh, understandable to the broader uh, paleomag community. So here we're defining dipolarity as F dip. This is the time average ratio um, at the core mantle boundary of the, the dipole to non-dipole field strength. And this has been looked at a, a lot on the dynamo community. And uh, there's sort of a Goldilocks zone where if it's too low, the field is multipolar or it's reversing too frequently. And if it's too high, the field is too stable and it just doesn't have the variability we would expect in an Earth-like dynamo. So the work of, of Domenico in, um, in his, his paper that just came out um, days ago is that he found that our total misfit QPM is a good proxy for FDIP. So this is, uh, if you recall, of score less than five suggests that the model is in 
uh, good agreement with Earth, and you see this fairly nice quadratic shape, which suggests that there's a min uh, there's an ideal um, dipolarity f dip value that will yield the most Earth-like dynamo, and we can get a set of models that do fall in that range. F dip is powerful though, because we can also use it in looking at individual parameters. So the one I want to focus on here is uh, F dip related to VGPA or the equatorial dispersion. And we see that for all of these terms, they all strongly correlate with F dip. And that tells us that when we're looking at the, uh, the magnetic field, particularly these PSV measures, they are telling us something about the dipolarity of the field. They're different lenses into a very similar insight. But this relationship in particular is so strong that we were trying to see, can we use this to actually model or predict or characterize something about Earth's field with this knowledge that we can use VGPA or the equatorial dispersion as an input. This question was what Andy Biggin was looking at, and this study came out at the end of last year. So he was asking, can we use uh, model GA to infer something about the morphology of the field? So this is looking at dipolarity still, but he's uh, kind of using a different uh, formulation of that, which is uh, we term axial dipole dominance. So the ratio of the axial dipole to the, the non-axial dipole terms at Earth's surface, and that this is um, an instantaneous value calculated for a single time step, and then we find the median over the entire uh, time interval. Um, if we were to look at the time averaged equivalent of that, it would approach infinity if the field was were gadlite. So when we do this comparison, we get a really nice kind of power law relation between VGPA and this uh, axial dipole dominance. And using this power law, we're now able to look at records of uh, the model G fits going back in time and say something about the uh, axial dipole dominance of the field. So there are three intervals. We can look at PSV10 and Cromwell for the last 10 million years. We can look at the Mesozoic uh, in this Dubravine study as part of the Iceland workshop. And we can even look in the Precambrian spanning um, the order of billions of years in some of these compilations. And what we find is that axial dipole dominance has stayed fairly stable going back through time. This is a bit of a surprising outcome because other aspects of the field are clearly changing. We can look at different field strengths like the lows in the Jurassic or the highs in the Cretaceous. We can look at different uh, reversal frequencies. And it seems like that using this relation that the axial dipole dominance is fairly insensitive to these other aspects of the evolution of the field. And trying to understand why that is is an ongoing question, but if you use the paleomagnetic record, and particularly the assumption that it's GAD-like in your work, if you're doing plate reconstructions, hopefully you can rest a little easier that this suggests that for the most part, that is a valid approach. So with this baseline expectation that the field is dipole dominated for most of Earth's history, I want to look at the times where maybe it's it's not, or we have some hints that it might not be. And this is going to be a bit of a march through time, and this is going to be moving through different things fairly quickly, but I hope you'll bear with me. So this first thing I want to look at is the field about 10 million years ago. And this is the uh, the work of Yael Engbers, who's a PhD student at Liverpool. And she was looking at uh, PSV behavior in the South Atlantic. And the South Atlantic anomaly, as we know, is this uh, um, feature where the field is much weaker and much more variable than one would expect from a perfect kind of GAD field. And what she was able to do is sample lavas 8 to 11 million years ago and get an, aspect, an estimate of a uh, um, dispersion and that she found that it was much higher than one would expect from Model G or really any of the other data in the PSV10 data set. And there really aren't a lot of samples uh, available from the sort of region contained by the, the South Atlantic anomaly. So this suggests that inside this area, the field was more variable than uh, a purely uh, axial dipole would uh, suggest. And 
when you look at the present day uh, VGP for St. Helena, it's, it is highly anomalous compared to the uh, spin axis, but when we compare it to all of the other poles, so you can see that here in this plot, we find that it's not really that different from uh, this ensemble of data. So it's suggesting that this South Atlantic anomaly feature is likely a, a long-lived recurring feature, which um, is not suggestive necessarily of, say, like a reversal, uh, um, about to occur, but is some sort of longer wavelength feature of Earth's field. Now there's different ideas about what the source of the South Atlantic anomaly would be, but one of them is that it's related to the presence of these large low shear velocity provinces, which will affect whose presence will affect the, the, um, the distribution of, of heat flow at the core mantle boundary, and that will in turn control how the dynamo is being generated. So the next thing I want to talk about is the history of these large low shear velocity provinces. And this is going to be a bit of an aside, but I think it's sort of related to this bigger picture of what are the features that control the dynamo and what are the things that force deviation away from a, a simple GAD dominated field. Now, this isn't the work of the deep group. This was work that I did uh, at, at Rochester with, with John Tarduno where we were looking at the Hawaiian hotspot, and in particular, this question about uh, how, how much and when the Hawaiian hotspot was moving, and in a bigger sense, how can we reconcile predictions of where the Hawaiian hotspot would be using plate circuits and the actual observed trace of the seamounts. Now, prior to the bend in the hotspot, uh, this difference in plate circuits and the, the seamount trace is due to the uh, southward motion of the Hawaiian hotspot. But after the bend at about 49, 48 million years ago, uh, it's not exactly clear why we still see this persistent misfit in a plate circuit prediction versus the observed traces. And when we did a, a paleomagnetic study at Midway, uh, 28, uh, from uh, 28 million years old, we find that the paleo latitude is within uncertainty the same as the present day position of the Hawaiian hotspot. So unlike prior to the bend, we can't explain this misfit between the predicted position and the observed position is due to hotspot motion. So the other source where you can have this sort of uncertainty or this, sort of, this misfit is if the base of these plate circuit reconstructions, which is these Indo-Atlantic hotspots, if they have been moving. So there's this uh, uh, idea that uh, hotspots and mantle plumes are linked to these large low shear velocity provinces. And so if they, and it seems like these Indo-Atlantic ones relative to each other have not been moving a whole lot. But if they were to have moved in concert, that could explain why there's still this persistent misfit between the predicted position and the observed position of the uh, Hawaiian hotspot. And so we're suggesting that these LLSVPs can move fairly slowly, but when you look at um, tens and hundreds of millions of years, which they are likely to have existed for, that could be a significant um, a, a controlling factor in how our dynamo is being generated and observed at, with the change in these heat flux patterns. So that's just uh, one sort of aside of how we can add on additional complexity to the field generation and something to consider when we're developing uh, future dynamo simulations are these heat flux patterns and whether we should just rely on the present day distribution or maybe consider uh, alternate distributions based on uh, um, mantle flow models or other um, hypotheses. Looking further back in time, this is gonna be a story less of what we know and more of what we don't know. Uh, this, is, uh, this plot is showing a 20 million year bin uh, box plot distributions of field strength, again, based on the uh, pint compilation that we are in the process of updating. And what these arrows are showing are periods where the field is um, substantially weaker than the median field observed during the, the Phanerozoic. 
Uh, we know of the Jurassic that it's pretty well documented. I think the uh, uh, Kulikov uh, uh, paper, again, as part of this Iceland workshop, did a good job of showing that it was significantly weaker than, um, to say, at least the Cretaceous and, and perhaps the, uh, uh, the Phanerozoic uh, uh, mean. But we also see other weak field intervals, uh, maybe during the, uh, the, the Triassic, although we just don't have data. Uh, the Devonian is another instance where the field was uh, substantially weaker than, than the, the long-term average, as well as the Ediacaran uh, right now. You know, obviously, that is outside of the Phanerozoic, and I'll be talking about that more in, in the next slide. But I just want to highlight that um, these are uh, uh, challenging questions to answer about how we can have a field that is going substantially weaker on these kind of time scales. Is there a periodicity to it? And what does that tell us about the controls that are um, affecting the core and the dynamo generation? And I just want to highlight as well that a lot of the values that we're seeing out of the Devonian are uh, part of a, a Louise Hawkins a PhD, which she just completed at, at Liverpool, so she's to thank for all these uh, really exciting, very low values. So looking at the Precambrian and kind of um, ending with uh, the, the Ediacaran, uh, we have much less data. So the binning isn't really an appropriate way to look at it. And so here is a snapshot from the, the Planck data set. And then uh, superimposed, I'm showing the uh, values that uh, I isolated in, in 2019 as part of my work with John Tarduno at, at Rochester to look at uh, only units that are slow cooled or uh, other evidence to show that they're capturing a time average field. And when we just look at those, we see this steady decay during the Precambrian from uh, a high value that's uh, con uh, consistent with the sort of long term average of the field to the weakest we've seen the time average field get, which would be uh, at the Ediacaran. And in addition to this fitting this really uh, very crude polynomial, we uh, su suggested or we noted that the Dynamo simulation community has been uh, looking at whether the inner core could have started to grow around this same time period. And, and we suggested that maybe this extremely low value is uh, a signal that the inner core might have begun to nucleate at around this time. Continuing this exploration about how uh, Earth's field strength has changed over uh, the last 4 billion years and trying to fill in some of the gaps that we don't have in the observational record, we can return to uh, simulations. So these are thermal history models, part of a work of Chris Davies, a student Sam Greenwood, and, uh, and uh, the rest of the, the deep group, where we are looking at uh, thermal history models where we can vary uh, the present day heat flow at the core mantle boundary, this Q sub P, uh, some time scale to relate how uh, this heat flow, is, heat flow has changed um, over the last four and a half billion years of tau and then the jump in density associated with the formation of the inner core delta rho. And explore, and I should state that these all assume the higher conductivity of iron values. And exploring these thermal history models, what we find are these trends that look fairly similar to the one we suggested um, in 2019, where we see a steady decay in field strength up until the point of a minimum at inner core nucleation where then the field strength jumps up and reaches uh, something like present day field strengths. Uh, part of the effort of this work that I'm not going to focus on is how can we actually uh, scale these dynamo simulations uh, to uh, um, uh, Earth units, uh, amps meter squared or Tesla, and um, that that that's ongoing, but uh, it's not really the focus uh, here. What I wanted to highlight was two things. One, this steady decay. So here we pick the models um, looking at different changes in, in density that best fit um, our data set using these 200 million year bins. And we only used the, the black points, the ones that average at least 10 data points to do our best fitting, but we still find that uh, these predict inner core nucleation somewhere between 500 and, and 700 million years ago, which is pretty um, consistent with what uh, we suggested from uh, our 2019 study. 
but I point out like that's that's where we have the least amount of data spanning somewhere on the order of about uh, 400 to about 900 million years ago we have very little data and so really filling in that time interval in particular is, is critical to understand uh, the history of the core but I also just want to point out that there's um, another challenge with these models uh, they're they're very simple they, and they don't include features like LLSVPs or something else and what that results in is that we see a very large jump in field strength at the uh, inner core uh, formation and we don't really see that in our data you know there are none of these lows like what we see in the devonian being captured in these models so that tells us that we need more to explain them and we need additional complexities and that's something that, that lots of people are looking at including us but it's worth highlighting in our understanding of how to look at these uh, thermal history models and look at the data and where they, they, they fit and, and where they don't. So I'd like to go on, on another direction now and talk about this in this last part of my talk to look again at this general theme of how we can use our paleomag observations, our dynamo simulations uh, together to uh, fill in some gaps and allow us to make some testable statements about how Earth's field is behaving. And what I want to look at are giant Gaussian process uh, models. This, this is a kind of statistical model, and this began with Consul and Parker in, in 1988. And what's nice about these is they allow us to quickly generate a series of Gauss coefficients using um, the, your laptop or, or even probably your phone. You know, you do not require the complexity of a numerical dynamo simulation, uh, and you can feel confident that these are, are fairly Earth-like and plausible. So what this does is it's a set of rules that allow us to generate Gauss coefficients. So the axial dipole, uh, um, and often, uh, say, the axial quadrupole, and other low-degree terms can be drawn with a specified mean and standard deviation. And the rest of the, the spherical harmonic terms are assumed to have a zero mean in some uh, standard deviation that follows a scaling law. And in treating them this way, we can say that the Gauss coefficients are identically and independently distributed and, and thus can be uh, easily generated and then converted um, using the same equations shown earlier into uh, directions, declinations, and inclinations, uh, uh, field strengths at any point. Um, on, on the globe. Now these are um, not continuous in time. They don't they don't uh, capture how the field might change over um, minutes to hours to days. But if you average them together, they should give the bulk average properties of um, Earth's field. And now before I dive into to what we did and 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 our outcomes, I do want to highlight that there's a, another new GGP model that came out last year. Uh, uh, Daniel Brandt uh, uh, and others, and it's really interesting. Uh, they took a very different approach than we did, and I really encourage everyone to check that out as well. So the approach we did, though, is we looked at uh, our Dynamo models and asked, is there something we can learn from our Dynamo simulations to apply to these GGP models? And, and what, what we noticed was that when we look at the correlation between Gauss coefficients, there's a very strong correlation in some terms and not others, whereas a, a GGP assumes that everything is independent. There should be no correlation. So this is a kind of complex plot, and I'll try to, to walk through it uh, uh, quickly. But here we are looking at the correlation coefficient between uh, a pair of Gauss coefficients. And uh, if the, the cell is red, then it's a positive correlation. And if it's blue, there's a negative correlation. And if it's white, there's no correlation. Now, uh, so uh, the diagonal is, some, is a term's correlation with itself, which obviously will be one. So uh, in here, this, this um, upper left cell, this is the correlation between the uh, G31 and the, or G30 and the G10, the octopole and the dipole terms. And so you can see that for the most part, the Gauss coefficients are independent of each other, but there are select ones that are not, and they follow a very specific pattern, which is that Gauss coefficients of the same uh, order, M, 
and same family, odd or even, are correlated with each other. So G10, G30, G21, G41, etc. These are all strongly correlated. And this pattern is seen in every dynamo simulation I have looked at. Now, the strength of this correlation, the exact sign of it will vary, and we're still trying to figure out what is controlling how this covariance varies. But this pattern itself is present in pretty much every dynamo simulation we look at. And uh, my best guess about why that is, is because what we are looking at is something fundamental when you have a predominantly dipolar field. Uh, so that is uh, an, an odd field or, or equatorially anti-symmetric interacting with uh, flow, which is uh, dominantly equatorially symmetric. And it's this interaction that is going to allow for this exact pattern of correlation. Part of the significance of this covariance pattern that we observed is that the G21 term contributes strongly to VGP dispersion. By adding a, a covariance between G21 and G41, as well as H21 and H41, this allows for an increase in the latitude um, dependence of VGP dispersion for our GGP models. And so that's what we did. So we generated a, a new GGP model, um, which we call BB18. We tried to inherit the, the, the contributions um, of prior GGP models. We follow this odd even variance structure from, from TKO3. Uh, then we add this covariance that we get from Dynamo simulations. And then we also treat to get a better fit to the pint uh, data and distribution for the last 10 million years, we separate the uh, axial dipole variance term from the other variance structure. Um, and that's that's consistent with how even Constable Parker 88 treat things. And uh, putting that all together, we can get our new GGP model. We produce uh, two versions, a GAD version and a, a, a BB18.Z3 which includes uh, zonal terms for uh, degrees two and three as well. But this is the punchline. So uh, in, in the three measures that we looked at, which is comparing it to the pint data set and VDM distribution, uh, our VGP um, uh, dispersion versus latitude and inclination anomaly, we would argue that we've gotten uh, an improved fit to all three of these measures. Um, and it's in part because of the covariance that we are adding to GGP. And this is consistent with what we're seeing in the dynamo. So hopefully now, if you use this model, you're getting a set of Gauss coefficients that is more uh, realistic um, than, than um, would be available in a model that assumes uh, a strict independence uh, across all the Gauss coefficients. So I'm going to try to wrap everything up now um, and, and, and leave my uh, conclusions here. But the two big takeaways I hope, I hope you have is that this QPM criteria that we've developed uh, is, is a useful, testable workspace, and that the philosophy of bringing dynamo simulations to our observations is one that that's rich for exploration and again this is nothing new but these big gaps in the paleo intensity record exist and that they occur kind of when we're most interested in knowing what the field is doing and it's just that recurrent call to action to get more data thank you